Welcome to You and Your Health. I'm your host, Dr. David Bertone. Today we're going to talk about some recent advances in total hip joint replacement surgery. We know that there is approximately 300,000 hip joint replacement surgeries performed each year in the United States. We're going to learn about some of the advanced techniques that are being done here locally um, to help this process go a little bit more smoothly for people that require this procedure. Our guest today is Dr. Robert Borzio. Dr. Borzio is a graduate of the New Jersey Medical School at UMDNJ. He did a fellowship in joint replacement surgery at NYU, and he's now practicing at Orthopedic Sports Medicine and Rehabilitation with locations in Middletown and Morganville, and doing his surgeries at Bayshore Hospital here locally. Dr. Borzio, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Dave. So tell us about your background and how you got involved in doing hip joint replacement surgery and how you wanted to be an orthopedist. Sure. So I grew up in Middletown, New Jersey. My father is a veterinarian, and he introduced me to the field of medicine. Um, but I always knew I wanted to do human medicine and uh, not the veterinary medicine. So when I got to Penn State, I took one summer uh, during my summer vacation and I actually volunteered at Bayshore Hospital. Wonderful. Yeah, and that's where I saw my first hip and knee replacement. And from there, I knew I wanted to be a surgeon. And I didn't really know exactly what type of surgeon at that point. But then my dad got his knee replaced a couple of years later. And to see his quality of life from before the surgery to after the surgery, I mean, he works on a farm. And to see him get up and down off the tractor and be able to do everything that he could do 20 years ago but wasn't able to do because of arth his arthritis, it was amazing. So then I knew I wanted to do hip and knee surgery. Wonderful. I think that's important that um, people understand that this is a quality of life issue. This Definitely. is to improve people's function. Mm -hmm. And there's some really um, important advances that we're going to talk about in terms of specifically the, the hip joint. Mm -hmm. um, tell us a little bit about um, how people might require a joint replacement, especially the hip, and the different types of arthritis that may be the problem. Sure. So we do hip replacement surgery for arthritis, but that's not the only treatment we do for arthritis. Mm -hmm. So first, let's talk a little background about what is arthritis and the different types of arthritis. Uh, so there's osteoarthritis and then there's inflammatory arthritis. Osteoarthritis, the first, is degenerative arthritis. It's the arthritis of aging. Mm -hmm. Inflammatory arthritis is like psoriatic arthritis, which is psoriasis or rheumatoid arthritis. It's a lot less common, so I won't um, dwell on that. Mm -hmm. um, so osteoarthritis, uh, basically, um, it has to do with the cartilage in the joints. There's joints, knee joints, hip joints, shoulder joints. They all have cartilage, and they all are two surfaces rubbing together. Mm -hmm. um, over time, those surfaces, when they're rubbing together, they can start to wear. And when they wear, the little pieces of cartilage break off, and the body basically attacks those pieces. And that's where you get the swelling, the inflammation, and the pain. Um, so if you have knee pain and you don't understand why it starts raining and then all of a sudden now you, it's, it's more painful, that's likely arthritis mm -hmm. um, because it's affected by the humidity. So that's one of the things that people will recognize that changes with inclement weather. Mm -hmm. Are there any other signs and symptoms that people might say, this might be an arthritic problem and need to get investigated? So knees and hips, uh, you can't see the hip as much as the knee, but pain, swelling, and stiffness. Uh, those are the signs that you should go to your primary care or an orthopedic surgeon and get an x-ray. A simple x-ray is all you need to diagnose arthritis. Okay, so once they have the x-ray and it sh shows that there's some arthritis, it might not ne necessarily require joint replacement surgery, correct? No, it's not, not at all. It's not the first step. So there's going to be limitations in their function. What are some of the common non-surgical treatment options? Sure. So we start out with non-steroidal anti-inflammatories like Advil, Motrin, Aleve. Those medications help with the body um, and how I was talking about those particles, how the body attacks those particles, that can help that uh, process, the inflammation process, bring down the swelling, bring down the stiffness. Um, ice on the knee and the hip can also help. That also decreases the inflammation. The mainstay of treatment is really physical therapy though. Uh, trying to strengthen the muscle and stretches the muscle around the knees and around the hips keeps them strong and keeps the joints healthy. Okay. Uh, those are the mainstays of mild uh, to moderate arthritis. When it gets a little bit more advanced, you can talk about injections, the cortisone injections and the gel injections. Um, those therapies work very well. They can completely relieve your pain for about three to six months. Mm. The problem is after three months, you need another one, and then it's two months, and then it's one month. It's diminishing returns. Okay. Uh, and the problem is in medicine these days, we don't have 
um, a technology to reverse the process of arthritis. Once those cartilage cells start wearing down, um, there's no process to unwear them down. It's mm -hmm. like a tire's tread. Um, and unfortunately, the only long lasting thing we have is a hip replacement. So when we're talking specifically about the hip, you're, you might, in terms of the second step, might do an injection. How yes. would you typically in, and do that, and what would it be that you would use in that regard? So uh, at the Red Bank office, we have an x-ray machine, a fluoroscopy right in our office. Uh, we have the patient lay down, and sterilely we inject uh, using the x-ray guidance exactly into the hip joint. Okay. So and your first course will be a, a steroid injection? Usually first course is steroid. Um, the gel injections for the hip um, aren't backed by insurance usually, so okay. you would have to pay out of pocket for that. Um, but this cortisone injections are always um, backed by insurance. So the, the, um, the gel injections, that's commonly used in the knee. Mm -hmm. Insurance is paying for that? Yes, insurance is paying for that. The yeah. problem is it's, it's really anecdotal evidence at this mm -hmm. point. Um, a lot of my patients get great relief, but mm -hmm. unfortunately some patients get absolutely no relief. Mm -hmm. And that's why the Board of American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons uh, does not back those gel injections mm -hmm. at this time because there's, it's just too hit or miss. Yeah, and I've seen that also in my office that some people, maybe patient selection is an issue, maybe it's a little too far gone in terms of the joint issue. And How about some of the other non-surgical things that are being talked about like um, PRP or stem cell injections, is that something that's considered now? So those injections actually, um, they do the same thing as the cortisone injections. Oh, okay. Through a different pathway, they decrease the inflammation in the knee and the hip. Okay. Um, but those are far more in expensive than the cortisone and the gel injections, and they haven't had any proven benefits on the long run, unfortunately. Got it, so right now the gold standard when you have degenerative joint disease in the hip is a joint replacement. Um, and there's also other situations you might consider this, right? Traumatic mm -hmm. injuries or fractures. Or can you just explain that? Yeah, so in terms of getting arthritis, there's a couple of different ways, risk factors you could have. Excessive weight, a prior injury, that could get you arthritis faster, but mostly it's genetics. Uh, but there's other reasons to have a hip replacement. Um, if you have a fracture and the hip is no longer uh, usable, you have to reconstruct the hip, and we do that with a hip replacement. Okay. So it might be a step in terms of uh, you know other types of surgery. If you want to do some pinning or other mm -hmm. um, stabilization, you might decide to just do the replacement. It's a lot easier. It all depends. Cleaner. So hip fractures in this day and age, uh, there's studies that show if the patient is active beforehand, even if they don't have arthritis, they do better with a hip replacement mm. afterwards. Interesting. And that's because with the nail or the pinning that we do for the hip fractures, uh, we have to go through the muscles and pierce the muscles, and the patients do not recover well afterwards. Yeah. Now in terms of patient selection and evaluation, getting ready to do one of these procedures, are there things that you would be concerned about beforehand, either pre-existing conditions or uh, things that may prevent you from doing a joint replacement surgery? Yes, so in patient selection, there's many things. Uh, diabetes, we want your blood glucose control to be uh, under control. Basically, there's a long range test, the hemoglobin A1C. We want that under 7.5. Uh, we want you to lose some weight and be active beforehand. The problem is patients have such joint pain that losing weight is almost impossible for mm -hmm. them. And that's, you know, the loop that we're in. Um, and then there's specific si patient selection uh, for the different types of approaches to the hip replacement. Yeah, we're gonna go into the different types of approaches after the break, but um, how about in terms of the evaluation or the workup before the procedure? Are there any special tests that you might want to order um, to know a little bit more about the patient? Uh, so in terms of what I do with this hip replacement, all I need is an x-ray beforehand. Okay. Um, some different uh, ways robotic surgery will require a CT scan beforehand. Um, that's a lot of radiation and I'll go into that a little bit later, um, but all I need is an x-ray beforehand. Okay, so uh, we're going to talk about specifically the procedure itself, but there's really two main methods of doing a hip replacement. Um, one is a posterior lateral approach, and one is the one that you, you do primarily now is the anterior approach. Mm -hmm. Before, don't go into too specifics, but can you just tell us a little bit about the differences between the two of them? Sure. Uh, so the posterior approach, it goes through the back of the hip. So when you go through the back of the hip here, 
you have to actually detach the muscles here. This is the piriformis muscles, and these are your short external rotators. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you've heard of piriformis syndrome, but I can tell you that cutting these tendons right here and then having to reattach them at the end of the case, that's going to give you a little bit more than piriformis syndrome. Okay. Um, and all the studies have shown that the dislocation rates, uh, if you do a very good repair at the end, is the same for anterior and posterior approaches. Okay. It, the problem is the first two weeks. So the first two weeks are a lot harder when you have to reattach those muscles. Mm -hmm. um, by going through the anterior approach, we don't cut any muscles. We split through the muscles and spread the muscles. And by doing that, uh, the patients recover a lot faster. Yeah, so that's a, that's a difference we see in, in physical therapy is, um, you know, that muscle detachment and the weakness that develops. Mm -hmm. and, and most people may have trouble with some ambulation functions and difficulty on stairs and doing curves because those muscles are weak. Yeah. Um, how about, uh, before you get into the procedure itself, how about preoperative rehabilitation? Is there any benefits to that before somebody has surgery? Definitely. So getting the patient in good physical condition before the surgery helps them after the surgery in a couple of different manners. First, physical therapy, getting the muscles strong around the hip and teaching them how to use walkers, canes, crutches, that saves time. And this is when the patient's recovering from a hip replacement, mm -hmm. they'll already know how to do everything. Uh, so it's very important. I send all my patients to a joint program before the operation, a week before the operation, where they learn how to use crutches and they learn um, basically what's going to happen during the Some of the precautions and things. Mm -hmm. and, and is that done at the hospital? Who, who that is. That? Okay. Yep. Um, and that's, uh, is, that's a, so that's an educational program. People go uh, in a group or individually? To yeah, they have that? a group every Tuesday. Oh, that's wonderful. So every week we have a group and uh, we prepare them for the surgery. What about, what about in terms of, uh, uh, we talked about some of the other comorbidities, you know, um, people tend to be uh, overweight that mm -hmm. might have this problem. I know weight loss is important. Um, uh, is there like a target, like BMI, body ma yes. mass index, or anything that you're looking for that would be helpful? Definitely. So for the anterior approach, you need to have a BMI under 35. Okay. Um, having a BMI over 35 has been shown to have wound problems with, mm. the, with the anterior approach. Okay. Um, but if I do do a surgery on a patient over BMI over 35, I will use the posterior approach. Okay. So it's primarily because of the wound closure, mm -hmm. maybe some other complications that develop. Would you, uh, would you encourage a, you know, some kind of a fitness program, whatever they can do to improve their cardiovascular fitness? Definitely, the but it all depends on the patient yeah. and how they're doing. Mm -hmm. So if the patient has so much pain that they can't lose that weight, then I'll do a posterior approach. Got the it. first two weeks will be a little bit harder, but the end result will be the same. Okay. Now, if the patient wa has the ability to lose the weight, I'll say, great, lose the weight, we'll do the anterior approach, and you'll have an easier time in those first two weeks. Great. Okay, when we come back, we're going to talk specifically about um, anterior total hip replacement surgery and its many benefits to helping people recover uh, following this procedure. Well, Thomas, you've got prediabetes. But with more exercise and a change in diet, it can be reversed. I've tried exercising. It, it just makes me hungry for bacon. I love bacon, too. And who really likes to exercise? Not me. <laughs> me neither. <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we're good? What? Oh, you still have prediabetes. Big time. Caring for a family member can be challenging and lead to countless questions for them and for you. Find articles, tips, and tools from experts and others who have been in your place. The Caregiving Resource Center at aarp.org caregiving. Opioid dependence can happen after just five days. Know the truth, spread the truth. Welcome back to You and Your Health. I'm your host, Dr. David Bertone. Today's guest is Dr. Robert Borzio. Dr. Borzio is an orthopedic surgeon, a fellowship trained in joint replacement, practicing here locally in Middletown um, and Morganville, and performing surgery at Bayshore Hospital. Dr. Borzio, welcome back to the show. Thanks. So when we ended, we were starting to talk a little bit about the procedure of mm -hmm. joint replacement. One of the concerns is that people 
tend to use uh, pain medication or opioids before they decide to do surgery. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about that problem. So right now in the United States, there's an opioid e epidemic. Um, right now, the United States uses 80% of the world's prescription opiate medication, mm -hmm. and it's only 5% of the global population. Wow. So we're using most of the opiate prescription medication in the entire world. Also, 91 people die every day from opioid over, uh, overdoses, and that's from the CDC. Wow. So it's a huge problem. I'm sure when you go home, you have some prescription pain meds left in your medicine cabinet. The problem is those tend to end up on the street. Uh, so we need to remove them from the medicine cabinets and really control the opioids that we give our patients. Uh, the good thing is that hip replacement, uh, especially the anterior approach, will take away your pain. So it's a great way to try to get patients off that chronic narcotic use. It is important though to wean them down from the narcotics before the hip replacement. Yeah. So uh, let's talk specifically about the differences of anterior hip replacement versus posterior lateral, which has been done for many, many years. Mm -hmm. uh, if you can just describe for us what's done specifically with the anterior hip approach. Sure. So during the anterior hip approach, we go from the front. When you do the posterior, the patient's on the side like this. Mm -hmm. When you do the anterior, the patient's on the back like this. Mm -hmm. So we go through the front. And it's a muscle sparing procedure, meaning that we go through the muscles and we don't actually cut the muscles. Mm -hmm. So we go through the hip joint um, from the front and once we get down to the capsule area, we remove all the diseased arthritis parts of the hip joint. So this is your femur or your thigh bone and this is your pelvis uh, or the socket part of the ball and socket joint. Mm -hmm. So we remove the arthritic parts and then we replace them with titanium, ceramic, and plastic. Okay. And so when you remove them, um, how do you do that? Is that a sawing procedure or you cut, you cut um, you know, the end of the femur? Mm-hmm. Okay. So you can see on this model that we cut the end of the femur here and remove the arthritic part of the of the head. The ball primarily. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay. And then we also resurface the area of the socket here. Mm -hmm. um, and that allows you to implant these uh, Smith and Nephew implants. Okay. So tell me a little bit specifically about the implant. I know when we talked off camera, mm -hmm. there's a certain metal that's used now. Yes. What's that metal? So Smith & Nephew has patented this Verilast technology. And the reason why they call it Verilast is because it's been verified to last. Mm. So this technology is great. Basically, this femoral head here, it's made of oxinium. Mm. And that's a ceramic alloy. And it's the only type of ceramic alloy on the market. Uh, now this uh, oxinium along with this plastic here, it's high, highly cross-linked polyethylene. And these two surfaces together become a bearing surface. Mm. And that's the socket part and the ball part. And how they go together and how they rotate, um, it's basically how long is this going to last. Mm. Uh, so we have very good studies from um, Australia and England, the joint registry studies, and they showed that this has the best outcomes at seven years, with 99% survivorship. Okay. And this specific uh, replacement here, how, how long can somebody expect it to last? You said seven years, but I, I think it would go a lot longer. So this is the only bearing surface that has an FDA guarantee for 30 years. Wow, 30 years, okay. So there's no other surface on the market that actually has the FDA backing them like that. Mm -hmm. And the, um, the part that goes down into the femur, mm -hmm. what, what is that made of? So this is made of titanium. Okay. So this stem is made of titanium and it has hydroxyapatite around it. Now this hydroxyapatite is this really sticky surface and it actually promotes the bone to grow into the surface. Mm -hmm. And by three months, the actual bone is integrated into the whole, uh, hip replacement and the hip replacement becomes part of your body. Now, is there any other major difference of the anterior versus the, the more traditional posterior lateral approach that we need to let people know about? So it's, it's muscle sparing, mm -hmm. and uh, the first couple weeks is a little faster recovery. Yep. And it's also the fact that you're doing it on the patient's back uh -huh. instead of on the side. So by doing it on the patient's back, you're allowed to uh, use x-ray during the procedure. And by using x-ray, we can show that the cup, the part of the socket part of the hip replacement, 
is exactly in the place it should be, mm -hmm. and that the stem and the leg lengths the patient has afterwards, meaning is one leg longer than the other, you can tell that right during the case with the x-ray. Oh, okay. So in, in the past, they're laying on their side. You couldn't do an x-ray or you couldn't compare the sides? You have to feel the feet, literally. Um, so it's a little bit less accurate. I'll tell you about what I do later with navigation and mm -hmm. when I do that approach. But classically, yes, it was all a guessing game. Oh, okay. You look at the cup, oh, that looks okay. It should be within 10, 15 degrees of what's normal. Now we know exactly. We see the x-ray, we see exactly how it's supposed to look. And that's because they're laying on, your, on their back. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the um, recovery afterwards, is there any major differences or what are some of the things people should expect? Definitely. So when you're doing the uh, posterior approach, uh, people use posterior precautions. So if you've heard of the no bending past 90, mm -hmm. um, you can't tie your shoes in the shower, you have to have a lift on the toilet seat, you have to have a lift um, and you can't sleep in certain positions. Can't cross your legs. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So um, in the anterior approach, I use something called universal hip precautions very simple no extreme movements in any direction mm -hmm. so just functional movements and nothing extreme and nothing that's uncomfortable you can sleep how you want you can do everything you want to do it's just no extreme positions so does is there a need for things like the pillow between your no, knees no 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 okay yeah and what about like the that. immediate ability to walk after surgery is there a major difference definitely so the surgery takes about an hour and 15 minutes mm -hmm. um, about an hour after the surgery you're up and walking with a physical therapist at Bayshore mm -hmm. it's amazing okay then you stay one night in the hospital and then the next day you're home okay um, and in terms of the posterior approach what's different about it uh, is the recovery a little bit longer that early yeah, on so it's exactly what I was talking about with those tendons having to heal. Mm. Um, it makes the recovery a little bit slower. Studies have shown that uh, using a cane, you can uh, basically expect to use it about a week longer with the posterior approach than the anterior approach. Okay. My goal is that by two weeks you're not using a cane with the anterior approach and some patients even one week. Uh, one of the big risks is uh, dislocation of the hip. Is mm -hmm. there a difference between the approach and the incident So rate? there used to be a thought process that the anterior had less dislocation. Um, recently, in the past five years, it's basically been proven uh, that the dislocation rate is about the same. Okay. Um, that's because they do such a good repair of the posterior structures. It's just, it's a little bit more painful. Is that, is the posterior, the older procedure take a little bit longer to do because of that? Uh, no, no? Uh, both procedures can be done at about the same time. Okay. And um, in terms of the um, uh, long-term restrictions, mm -hmm. say after a normal surgical healing, is there anything people should be avoiding after these procedures? So. I don't tell my patients to avoid anything. At okay. three months, once the bone is ingrown into the implant, I tell them go skiing, play tennis, do everything that you want to do. Okay. And what about high velocity jumping or things like that? Would, would that be a problem? So jumping and running high velocity, uh, yes, you may wear down your hip a little bit faster than if you didn't do that. Okay. Um, but these are the best times of people's lives. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's more important that patients do the activities that they want to do. That's why they did the hip replacement itself, because yeah. they want to get back to those activities. What about age uh, choice here in terms of somebody, say, has significant arthritis in their late 40s or early 50s? Is there a problem with doing an approach that early? Or? So there's a give and take. When you have a hip replacement that you want to last for about 30 years and you're doing it in somebody who's 40 year old, that's more the inflammatory arthritis. Mm -hmm. So those patients get arthritis a lot earlier in life. And we still do hip replacements very early on. And the reason is because we know that this is going to last 30 years and by the time 30 years comes, the technology is going to be that much better. Mm -hmm. And All it's right. going to be that much easier to do a revision. So don't live in pain and get the surgery if you need the surgery. Great. Now, after the surgery, um, people go home fairly quickly. And then um, talk a little bit about the post-op rehabilitation. And that's something I'm very uh, involved in mm -hmm. in our practice, seeing the patients post-op. How quickly do you like them to get to outpatient therapy? Do mm -hmm. they need inpatient rehab or home therapy? What's your 
common approach. So that. we want everybody to have home therapy after the after okay. the procedure. So patient satisfaction is shown to be higher if the patients go home, have the physical therapist and a visiting nurse come to them for the first two weeks, and then start going to an outpatient physical therapy. Okay. And uh, the study shows that that's a better recovery for them. Mm -hmm. And we know the inpatient rehab, there is a, a bigger risk for infections mm -hmm. and things like that. So I know that's one of the reasons why you want to do that. There are situations that that might be required, correct? Of course. Yeah. So if, if you're not able to recover, if it's a complex surgery, if it's not your standard approach, um, then always we'll, we'll not kick you out of the hospital. You know, we'll get you to the, where you need to be. Got and it. we have physical therapists in the hospital that make that decision along with the social workers. Mm -hmm. Great. Now, how about some of the, the, the future trends? Um, right now, you're doing the procedure um, in the hospital. Is there going to be a day that you can do it same day, outpatient, people leave? Definitely, and we're already doing it. Oh, okay. Um, so outpatient surgery is definitely the way of the future in joint replacement. Uh, you alluded to it a little bit before about the infection that you can get in hospitals. So the in-hospital infections like MRSA and some of the other hospital-acquired bacteria, they can be devastating to a joint replacement. Mm -hmm. um, if you get an infection in a hip replacement like that, then you have to take everything out and put in a temporary hip replacement made with antibiotics. Mm -hmm. That temporary joint is in for three months and then you need another procedure after that. Yep. So it is truly devastating. We wanna avoid that no matter what. So that's why one of the strategies is moving to this outpatient um, joint replacement. Now, how do we do that? How do we send a patient home that same day? You know, and how do we explain to the patient that it's actually better? Mm -hmm. um, and the reason is because of that infection rate, and we can do it because of the anterior approach and something called multimodal pain management. So by giving the patient pain medications that work on multiple different pathways, we can actually control the pain so much better. Mm -hmm. So before the procedure, we give them about four different medications, uh, one anti-inflammatory, Tylenol, a nerve medication, gabapentin, um, and we give them that before the procedure to try to head off the pain mm -hmm. immediately after the procedure. Then during the procedure, we give an injection called Expiril and we give it directly into the muscles that we spread along here. And those muscles aren't, aren't cut, like I said before, but they are bruised. And if we give that medication directly there, we can get 72 hours of pain relief right into that muscle area. Then after the procedure, uh, we give another mix of medications to go home with. Now, you would think that opiate medications would be necessary in this case. Mm -hmm. Oh, we need the strongest medications because we have to send the patient home, but that's the exact opposite. Opiates actually with the constipation, the nausea, the vomiting, and the delirium that it causes, mm -hmm. it actually causes patients to stay in the hospital longer. And by not using opiates in my rehab protocol uh, after the procedure, we're getting opiates off the streets too. Awesome. Um, so in terms of, uh, quickly, any future trends in terms of the prosthesis itself? What do you see down the road? Is it different materials or robots or what's, what's going to happen? Here? Exactly. So if I am forced to use the posterior approach, if I'm doing a revision, I'm a revision surgeon, or if I'm doing a patient who's very overweight, I will do a posterior approach, but I use navigation when I do it. Oh, okay. So basically you attach a camera onto the pelvis and the camera is looking directly at the cup here and directly at the stem here and it will tell you the same things that the x-ray is telling me from the anterior approach the leg length the position of the cup so yes you're gonna have a little bit slower recovery because it's the posterior approach um, but you know that your implants are going to be right where they need to be because I use a navigation system awesome now robotic mm -hmm. surgery mm -hmm. like navigation surgery will put it exactly where it needs to be um, but unfortunately you need a bigger exposure mm -hmm. so that bigger exposure means more blood loss more time in the operating room, more time in the operating room can increase your infection rate. And there's no studies right now to say that robotic patients actually do better than navigation patients. Right. This takes me about five minutes longer to put the navigation in. Mm -hmm. Robotic surgery takes about 20 minutes longer. Yeah, so that's a big difference. Well, Dr. Borzio, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. We appreciate you. it. So you've been with us, uh, you and your health. I'm your host, Dr. David Bertone. Until next time, uh, we'll see you then.